Good evening, wherever you may be, and a hearty welcome to the service of evening prayer, an outreach and worship ministry of the Church of the Ascension in London, Ontario, Canada. We are gathered this evening in the back garden in our home here in London, and I'm pleased to bring you this time of prayer, encouraging you to bring your prayer needs, concerns, and petitions to our prayers together. Today is Monday, the 26th of July. We're in the week of the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. Just before getting to our prayers, let's take a moment to see what else is happening in the world on this day. Today is known as Aunt and Uncle Day, or Aunt and Uncle, if you prefer. As the name suggests, it's that day to celebrate a special set of relatives, your aunts and your uncles. Uh, I was an only child, and I said that I uh, would wonder what would happen had I married an only child. We would have had no aunts and uncles. Uh, fortunately, my wife has two sisters, and so our children do have aunts and uncles. Uh, I uh, came from uh, large, larger background families. My mother had two brothers. My father ha was from a family of six surviving children. And uh, so lots of aunts and uncles in my memory. And many joyful memories of time spent uh, visiting those aunts and uncles, uh, being in their home, sharing interest with them of various sorts. Uh, one uncle, my uncle Alfred, was a railway engineer. Uh, for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Uh, it's, uh, he was uh, uh, bumped down to position of uh, the yard hostler. It was his duty to prepare the uh, locomotive for the uh, Midnight Express. And sometimes on a Saturday we would visit when no brass were around, sit and talk a little while in his little shanty, and then I got to go with him, help him with the oiling, the firing up of the engine, and then actually backing it up, pulling that throttle, uh, and putting it on the ready track for when the train was uh, was ready to come through. So one memory I have, another uh, uncle was a high school science teacher, and I loved talking science with him, and so it went with my various uncles. Uh, very pleasant memories of, uh, of all my uncles and all my aunts. Uh, sadly, nearly all are gone now, uh, but those are certainly days to remember. I'm fortunate enough now to have two nieces and two nephews, and a couple of great nieces and uh, a real joy except for the youngest uh, Facebook friends of uh, all my nieces and nephews and one uh, one great niece uh, so it's Aunt and Uncle Day and I hope it's a day that you have a way of celebrating in one way or another it's also coffee milkshake day the term milkshake first appears about 1885 but at that time, it was an adult drink with whiskey and eggs. In other words, much more in the style of eggnog. But by the turn of the century, they were starting to add ice cream to it and taking the liquor out and giving flavors, and it became more a drink for the whole family. And by the 1930s, malt shops were very common. And by the 1950s, if you were a fan of Happy Days, that TV show, you'll remember how much of it was set in the malt shop as people would come and go and have great big milkshakes or ice cream sodas. The history of coffee milkshakes is, uh, is a little bit different. Much of it is actually influenced by a, a coffee company, Starbucks. They started with one store in Pleist Pl Pike Place Market in Seattle in 1971. In 1983, CEO Howard Schultz had traveled to Italy, and he was impressed by the coffee shop culture there. Uh, people were pausing regularly for espresso uh, or other drinks, cappuccino uh, and lattes, and he thought there's no reason why North Americans couldn't do the same thing and he saw the potential to develop that kind of a culture. By 1987, that little one shop had grown to 18 or 17 stores, including Vancouver, British Columbia, and Chicago. And in 1995, they began offering Frappuccino, chocolate and coffee flavored beverage blended of various sorts, and they were beginning to look more and more like milkshakes. And at that time, they had 797 stores. Other coffee shops began adding uh, 
coffee milkshakes to their menu of items. Starbucks, by the way, now has 32,660 uh, coffee shops almost throughout the world. But quite separately, other uh, places began adding coffee to their chocolate milkshakes. Two come to mind. One I was very familiar with, Amos Steer Inn in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, they introduced what they called the Broadway milkshake in the mid-1960s. It was essentially a chocolate milkshake with uh, coffee syrup and lots of whipped cream. And it was one of my favorite items to order there, in addition to their amazing uh, rainbow trout. They also had the wonderful tradition I would love to see more places have, uh, bringing when you sat down uh, big bowls of dill pickles, sauerkraut, uh, and pickled beets. Uh, that alone you could almost make a meal. Uh, interestingly, it was one of the first places I took uh, Susan on a date well before she'd become my wife, and the summer before I was, uh, before we were married, uh, summer jobs were not that uh, plentiful, and she got a job on the midnight shift working there, while well, I was working midnights as a hospital orderly. I was actually doing that for a form of seminary credit, because they wanted us to spend at least one term in what they called immersion, doing a job where you would get your hands dirty. So the classmates that were working as garbage collectors or picking up uh, scrap papers in parks. Uh, one fellow worked in a sewage treatment plant. Uh, because that was an era when many people went directly from university to seminary without getting their hands dirty anyway, although a lot of others of us did. Uh, I had worked uh, in swimming pool maintenance. Uh, I had also worked uh, cleaning uh, houses, filling in for a friend who was spending a term abroad studying, uh, and uh, worked as a social worker for much of a year. So I'd had some other experiences, but it was quite interesting to have that job, uh, and once a week uh, we would get together with our classmates and discuss what we were learning and preparing what we call critical incident reports of things that took place where we experienced growth in one way or another. Uh, elsewhere, uh, there was also a place called a coffee cabinet in Rhode Island during World War II that served uh, chocolate and coffee milkshakes. So, a uh, little bit of background there, maybe more than you wanted on coffee milkshakes, but now let us say our prayers. This is Monday. I enjoy sometimes calling Monday Memory Monday, and so we are turning to the familiar words of the Book of Common Prayer, hoping that for many of you this will bring back pleasant memories of earlier years spent in church. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our psalm today is Psalm 65. Praise is due to thee, O God, in Zion, and unto thee shall the vow be performed in Jerusalem. Thou that hearest a prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. My misdeeds prevail against me, O be thou merciful unto our sins. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and receivest, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the pleasures of thy house, even of thy holy temple. Thou shalt show us wonderful things in thy righteousness, O God of our salvation. Thou art the hope of all the ends of the earth, and of them that remain in the broad sea. Who in his strength setteth fast the mountains, and is girded about with power? Who stilleth the raging of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the tumult of the peoples? They also that dwell in the uttermost parts of the earth are afraid at thy tokens, Thou that makest the outgoings of the morning and evening to praise thee. Thou visitest the earth and waterest it, thou makest it very plenteous. The river of God is full of water, thou preparest their grain, for so, so thou providest for the earth. Thou waterest her furrows, smoothing the ridges thereof. Thou makest it soft with the drops of rain, 
and blessest the increase of it. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness, and thy path, paths drip with fatness. The pastures of the wilderness drip, and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also stand so thick with grain that they laugh and sing. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Today we turn again to the book of the Acts of the Apostles. We are reading, starting in the 15th chapter, at verse 36, and continuing into the 16th chapter, at verse 5. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Come, let us return and visit the believers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord, and see how they were doing. Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul decided not to take to take with them the one who deserted them in Pamphylia and had not accompanied them in the work. The disagreement became so sharp that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and set out, the believers commending him to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul went on also to Derbe and to Lystra, where there was a disciple named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the believers in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and had him circumcised because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went from town to town, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in numbers daily. A large part of the book of Acts does not make it into our three-year cycle of Sunday readings. We rarely read from the book of Acts, except during the Easter season, when it takes the place of the epistle reading, usually from one of the other letters. But because the book of Acts is written in letter form by Luke to Theophilus, uh, we do here uh, pick it up now and then. But these verses, which contain a lot of serious information, are not verses you would hear if you went to church every Sunday for three years, because they are not in that three-year cycle of readings. But we do have it in our daily cycle of readings. Uh, considering there are two-year cycles here uh, in the daily readings, rather than the three-year cycle, but you'll get at least... Uh, 14 times as much. Now, there's some repetition, obviously, but a lot more than you would get in the Sunday readings. Just wanted to kind of make that clear, and these verses, as I said, are very important, because these verses give us the beginning of Paul's second missionary journey. Almost all Bible scholars would say at the point at which Paul left <clears throat> Antioch, and uh, separated from Barnabas. Uh, at that point marks the beginning of his second journey, a journey that would take some two to three years. Scholars are in some disagreement on how long of a time there was between these, the first and the second journeys. Some say a matter of months, others say as many as five years. We don't really have other background information to tell us that, I'm guessing myself about a year, uh, but that is only a, a guess on my part. But uh, Paul said to Barnabas, Come, let us return to visit the believers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Paul very much had the heart of a pastor. It wasn't enough just to start a new congregation. 
Paul wanted to visit them again. He wanted to see how they were doing, what had taken place since he was last there. He did not have the benefit of having a Zoom conference with them. He couldn't phone them up. He couldn't send them a telegram. He depended upon slow messenger service, and he wanted to see for himself, and he invited Barnabas, let us go. Well, Barnabas wanted to bring along John Mark. John Mark, we are told, was cousin to Barnabas, and so they were very close. But Paul objected to that, and the reason was because when they were in Pamphylia, and we are going to go further, John Mark bailed. He didn't want to be a part of it. We talked about it when it happened, and I said, this is going to come up later. Just wait and see. Uh, we don't know if, uh, if he was feeling ill, if he had some other urgent reason to return to Jerusalem. Uh, was there tension already in the relationship that we're not told about? For what reason did he decide to go back? Well, now, he is obviously either with them in Antioch or available in Antioch. And Barnabas says, let's bring along my cousin John Mark. He would be helpful. Paul said, I don't think so. I do not like that idea at all. Remember how he cut out from us? He left us. He didn't want to be with us. How can we trust him now? We take him, it's just going to be problems. I can see it will be more problems. How far will we go before he decides he doesn't want to go again? Now, I'm putting words in, uh, in both mouths of Barnabas and of Paul. But we are told that uh, the disagreement became so sharp that they parted company. So I suspect that stronger words were spoken than what I have said. And I'm wondering, was there one guilty party or two guilty parties? Generally, when I've been asked to intervene in a dispute, and that request comes to us clergy now and then, that uh, I find that there are uh, there's more guilt enough to go around on both members of the party. I certainly found this out when I have done marriage counseling, uh, and I will tell you I think it's a thankless task. But uh, it's uh, just when people disagree, it's because two of them were disagreeable. In spite of how Paul was able to reach compromise back in Jerusalem and had a letter indicating that that compromise was reached, uh, it did not seem that it was going to work. So they agreed to disagree and they agreed to split company. Barnabas took Mark with him and they went down to Cyprus. I'm sure there was much mission work to be done yet in Cyprus. Uh, you may remember that on his first missionary journey, Paul went from east to west across Cyprus. And it would make sense they would go and see how those churches were doing. We don't have many further reports on how their journey went. We don't have a record of the missionary journey of Barnabas uh, and John Mark. Uh, we do know, at least we assume, that John Mark was the writer of the second gospel, the gospel according to Mark. Uh, he uh, was gaining information along the way, we're sure. He may have gone, wanted to go back to talk more with Peter. Peter seems to have been his informant on that, but they did go their separate way. And Paul chose Silas. Silas has been a bit of a silent partner until now, but he was well respected, and Paul chose Silas, and they went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. And so we assume, while not all the churches are, are named, he went back to those churches that he visited, and those are therefore included on his second missionary journey. He went strengthening the life of those churches in one way and another. And then as we get into chapter 6, we're told that they went on to Derbe and to Lystra. And in Lystra, there is a disciple by the name of Timothy. Uh, his mother, her name is given elsewhere as Lois, uh, was Jewish, but his father was Greek. 
We are told that his mother was a strong believer, but we are not told about his father. Uh, most scholars assume that his father was not a believer, uh, at least not a believer in Christ, uh, perhaps a believer in the whole Greek system of gods at that time. Uh, we don't have that information, uh, but many scholars think that may be the case. Uh, it's also the case that Timothy had not been circumcised. Some scholars suggest that what may have happened is that Timothy's mother, a good believing Jewish person at the time who converted to Christianity, would have wanted him to be circumcised, but we're looking at a time when uh, Father knows best, shall we say, when the man's word was the law, and if the Greek father said, no, he will not be circumcised, that's the way it was. Now, we've got this interesting problem, that after fighting so long that new converts to Judaism, Gentile converts, should not need to be baptized, Paul decides that it would be significant to have Timothy baptized. And some of the translations say, and Paul baptized him. Others indicate Paul, or, or Paul, Paul circumcised him. Others indicate he arranged for the circumcision. We don't have that information for certain, and the, uh, the Greek can be translated both ways. Whatever the case, Timothy was circumcised at the direction, and it would appear the initiation of Paul. Now, is this all contradictory? Most scholars would say, no, it is not, because Timothy had the unusual situation of being a Jew rather than a Gentile. Yes, he had a Gentile father, but the Gentile uh, father was not as important because traditionally Judaism was passed through the mother. And there are a number of Jewish believers in the area where they are going to be going. And for a Jewish believer, it might be problematic that Timothy, with all claims to Judaism, had not been circumcised in the way that males in Judaism would be circumcised. So the suggestion from many scholars is that to avoid that controversy, to head it off before it starts, uh, if you remember on the Andy Griffith show, Barney Fife, his deputy, got a nip it in the bud, got a nip it in the bud, he would always say to the sheriff, Andy, got a nip it in the bud. And that's what Paul may have wanted to do. And I realize that that word nip may have a little extra meaning in what I'm talking about. I kind of blundered into that one, but uh, that may be uh, why Paul thought it important to have Timothy circumcised. And it's obvious that Timothy must have said, yeah, that's okay. Or he'd have said, I'm headed down to Crete. I think I belong with, uh, with Barnabas uh, and John Mark. Uh, and Paul and Timothy did have a very close relationship. Uh, and uh, uh, some have said almost like father and son. And uh, two of the letters of Paul in the New Testament are letters written to Timothy. Uh, that's how important their relationship was. And uh, in those letters, uh, Paul speaks about the faith of uh, not only his mother, but also his grandmother, Lois and Eunice. Uh, so he had come to know the family also, a close relationship. And of course, as I said, Barnabas and John Mark had a close family relationship of being cousins. Just the other day, we observed Cousin Day, and now we are considering um, Aunts and Uncles Day, and that kind of relationship. Maybe Paul became an honorary uncle. Our children had several of our close friends uh, that they called Aunt and Uncle, and I think still do to this day, because of the relationship we had, and we were living at, at that time uh, some hours from their actual aunts and uncles, but they have remained close to their actual actual aunts and uncles also. But uh, just uh, kind of the way that all fits together here. So they continue their journeys going town to town 
And Paul brings along the letter that the council in Jerusalem had written and shares it wherever they go, in spite of the fact that it might seem contradictory to what is said in the letter, here are the things that are necessary. And it has to do with a few dietary restrictions. Don't eat things that have been uh, sacrificed to idols. Don't consume blood. Uh, and uh, oh, what was that other one? It'll come to me. Uh, but uh, those particular restrictions. Oh, and no fornication. Yes. Uh, so the final verse in our reading for today. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in numbers daily. I think that was exactly Paul's intention in uh, going back to these churches that they had started uh, to keep them strong in the faith, to be sure things were going well. And obviously, during their time there, this exciting news that they were increasing in numbers daily. Wouldn't we be excited if our churches were increasing in numbers daily? Um, sometimes it seems as if uh, we just don't grow the way we could. Uh, we are called to go into all the nations of the world, to all the peoples of the world. And we've, uh, we've talked before about how inclusive the early church was becoming. And can our churches become more inclusive in those that they welcome into the faith? Uh, just good words to think about. As now we look at a few of the things that happened on this day, the 26th of July, in history. A birth of note in 1856, playwright George Bernard Shaw was born in Dublin, Ireland. He's the only person to have received both a Nobel Prize in Literature, which he received in 1925, and to received an Oscar, which he received in 1938. Interestingly, in spite of all of his work as a, as a playwright, uh, a dramatist, he also was uh, a co-founder of the London School of Economics. He died in 1950 at the ripe old age of 94 from complications of an injury of injuries he incurred by falling while pruning a tree at age 94. Uh, in 1882, Richard Wagner's opera Parsifal premiered at the Bayreuth Festspiel House in Bayreuth, Germany, which is kind of known as Wagner's town. If you were to visit that town, there is so much there dedicated to him, and there is a Wagner festival in Bayreuth every summer. Uh, the opera was uh, based loosely uh, upon uh, the story of Arthurian knight Parsifal, or Percival in English, and his quest for the Holy Grail. So today we can be thankful for the uh, creative musical genius of Richard Wagner. And another birth of note, Aldous Huxley, author of uh, Brave New World, was born on this day in 1894 in Galdaming, Surrey, England. Uh, a futuristic novel, uh, one I read in high school, along with uh, 1984 and uh, George Orwell's book. And when Orwell wrote 1984, Aldous Huxley sent him a congratulatory telegram. Uh, similar kinds of books of a futuristic, dystopian, authoritarian society. Uh, we can be thankful for the creative genius of authors like Aldous Huxley and George Orwell. And one more birth of note. Uh, on this date in 1943, Michael Philip Jagger was born in Dartford, Kent, England. Best known, of course, as a lead singer and founding member of the Rolling Stones. We want to wish a happy 78th birthday, Mick. Uh, keep singing away for us. Uh, in 1945, Winston Churchill resigned as Britain's Prime Minister after losing a landslide election to Clement Attlee, who then became Prime Minister of Britain. 
as I like to say in these occasions, uh, let us be thankful for all who are willing to let their name stand for public service and who serve us in, in any way in elected or appointed office. Uh, it is that kind of dedication uh, to community and the larger world uh, that I think is very important uh, and it should be celebrated. And now, let us return to our prayers. We turn to the Nuc Dimittis. Lord, now let us thou, thy servant, depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. To be a light to lighten the Gentiles, and to be the glory of thy people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. And we pray now, each in the language of our choosing, that prayer our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us, and grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the Queen, and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. And do thy ministers with righteousness, and make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people, and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, and evermore mightily defend us. O God, make clean our hearts within us, and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. And our collect for this week, O God, whose never-failing providence ordereth all things both in heaven and earth, we humbly beseech thee to put away from us all hurtful things, and to give us those things which be profitable for us, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, from whom all holy counsels, all desires, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness, to the merits of Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord. And by thy great mercy, defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, in a moment of silence, we bring our special prayers to this time together. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord, to make our common supplications unto thee, and has promised that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their request. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us, in this world, knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you and those you love and those that you would pray for, today and always. Amen. Thank you so much for joining with me in evening prayer. I wish you a pleasant evening. I wish you a very restoring night's rest and hope that you can join again tomorrow and throughout this week as we gather for evening prayer. Go now in peace. May the God of peace go with you. Amen.